A lot of people don't think about this, and that attorney is going to tell them, all right, where are all the documents? Where's the wills? Where's the trust? Oh, they're in a, a file cabinet? Grab that. 20 years down the line, if you go and ask for the documents to that mortgage company, they're not going to have the records. And I have seen people lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hey, everyone. How's everyone doing? This is Ryan Dreyer, managing attorney of Real Father's Rights. Today, I want to talk about saving you money in 20 years. So, I was talking with someone the other day, and we were discussing how a lot of people younger in their early 30s and their early 40s, their late 20s, are storing all their information on the cloud and storing information electronically. I wanted to discuss some of the pitfalls that will show up uh, years down the road. So some of these um, hidden dangers that you might not be thinking about uh, when you are storing information. So one of the first things I wanted to talk about is making sure that you have the documents that show your separate property. And there's a couple areas I want to talk about. One, inheritances, right? When you get an inheritance, you need to make sure that you have one, a digital copy of that inheritance, and two, a hard copy of that inheritance, whether it be a will, a trust, uh, a bequest, a devise, anything that shows that you received money or a gift prior to marriage or during marriage from your relatives or from someone else. So we need to hold on to these documents because when you're married, you're going to need to prove if you have a divorce, that you have separate property. Also remember that all property acquired during marriage is presumed community property, and you have to prove that it is separate property in nature. So another area that we look at is what we call a Family Code 2640 reimbursement. A Family Code 2640 reimbursement enables a person that has put on separate property into a community property asset to receive that money back dollar for dollar. So, a couple different scenarios by um, way of example. One, you have $100,000 in savings prior to marriage. You get married and down the line, you take that $100,000 and you put it down on a house that's jointly held in both your names. So you've purchased real property, but you've used that separate property um, to make the down payment. If in, the, in the event that you get a divorce, you get that money back dollar for dollar. So say uh, 25 years later, you are going to get a divorce and your spouse says, well, we're going to share this 50-50. That's not what happens first. First, you're going to get your 2640 reimbursement back dollar for dollar. So if you put that $100,000 down, you get that $100,000 back. And you get that back prior to splitting any equity. So we look at it as almost like a secured lien on against your house proceeds. So say you have a million dollar house there's $600,000 on a first and second mortgage, and then you have a $100,000 reimbursement. Under that, you would pay off the loan when the house is sold, you'd get the $100,000 back, and then you would each split the equity 50-50, so you would each get $150,000. Scenario two, you own a house prior to marriage. You get married with your new spouse, you guys continue to live there for some time, and then you buy a new house and you sell house number one. You take the proceeds from house number one and you're putting a down payment on that house. Under this scenario, your separate property would be, um, again, credited under a family code 2640 reimbursement. Okay, so we've got the general scenarios down. How does this actually work? Well, you have to prove it and you have to prove it by documents, not just by well, I said I did this, right? Because your spouse is going to say, there might have been separate property, but I don't remember. I don't remember where it came from. So you, what, what are you going to need? You're going to need um, either bank records 
or seller's closing statements, buyer's closing statements. You're going to want to have all of these documents set up and in your possession in order for you to prove your claim. If you can't prove your claim, you're not going to get the money. And so a lot of people don't think about this, that 20 years down the line, if you go and ask for the documents to that mortgage company, to that bank, to other things, they're not going to have the records. They only keep the records for about seven years. And I have seen people lose hundreds of thousands of dollars because they can't trace their 2640 reimbursement. So, so what do we do? What are our best practices? Number one, I'd say, is to keep a hard copy and keep it someplace safe, whether that is a safety deposit box, uh, your parents' house, somewhere where you can put it away from anyone else. A file cabinet in your house, I wouldn't recommend it because what happens in 20 years, your wife or your husband, but mostly your wife, is going to be angry with you, right? And she's going to go consult an attorney before you even know that divorce is on the horizon. Let's be clear here. What is it? 70% of all divorces are initiated by women. And most guys, we get into our comfortably numb, um, we just are in our routine, um, we're just living day to day. We're not thinking about moving on. We're not thinking that our spouse will ever divorce us. But what if they are? Here's what they're going to do. They're going to go to an attorney, and that attorney is going to tell them, all right, where are all the documents? Where's the wills? Where's the trusts? Where's the social security statements? Where are the birth certificates? Oh, they're in a, a file cabinet? They're going to tell them to grab that. It's the same thing with a prenuptial agreement. They're going to tell them prior to the divorce, prior to any of this, grab those documents and hold those documents, right? And so before you even know what's happened, if you don't have things backed up, you're they're going to take all of those documents and then they're going to say that, no, I didn't take that. That never existed, right? And they're going to basically keep you from making a claim that is probably worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Do I sound uh, do I sound jaded here? Maybe a little, but I've seen it happen again and again and again. Generally speaking, uh, and this is for my guys out there, you're the last to know when a divorce is coming, right? Women generally will have these things planned out. They'll have an ex uh, an escape plan. Now, I'm not trying to be sexist because there's lots of men that pre-plan divorce as well. This works in either way. I'm just saying your standard average guy, let's be honest, doesn't think ahead as far as their spouse. We have to make sure that documents are in a safe place. So one, we have the hard copies. We need those hard copies because yeah, sure, things are stored on the cloud, they're stored other places. We want multiple points, right? We want multiple redundancies here. We need to have it saved in a safe file, um, you know, in, in a scan disk maybe, but scan disks get erased really easily. We wanted to have it on the laptop. We want to have it on the cloud. What I'm saying is you need to put this in as many accessible places. You need to have a backup plan. If you don't have a backup plan, then you suffer later on in life, right? So also when we're talking about protecting ourselves, right? We're not talking about being duplicitous, but we're talking about protecting ourselves. So that next comes into when you have separate property, say you put, you got money in and you put it into a house, but you had 50,000 more dollars. Where does that money go? Let me rule this here. I'm going to save you money again. I'm going to tell you again, thou shall not commingle. Do not commingle your money. If you commingle your money, you are directly placing that money at risk, right? That needs to go into a separate bank account. You are not putting your paycheck into an account that has your separate property. Why? Well, because your income, I don't care that it says it's your name on it, your income during marriage is owned by the community, which means your paycheck is community property. So if you are putting your paycheck into that account, you are commingling it. You are basically putting your separate property at risk by commingling it with your, your separate property. Now, are there ways that you can get around this? Yes, it's called hiring a forensic accountant. But 
The rule is if it becomes so commingled that you cannot determine on any specific day what the exact balance of community property and separate property is, then it is considered community property, right? So we have to like keep these things separate. Also, if we are transferring money, we need to make sure that we have the documents that allow us to trace. What is tracing? Tracing is following either community property or separate property through multiple forms of property, bank accounts, other things, right? So if we can't provide that clean trace from point A, let's say 20 years ago to today, well, then that asset's just going to be an asset that we have during marriage, and it's going to be presumed to be community property. So Let's, let's go back to our first example where the person had $100,000 prior to marriage. And let's make it a little more complicated. So they had that $100,000 prior to marriage. The couple buys house one. They put $100,000 down. He puts $100,000 down, right? That's his $2640. So now they go and they sell. Let's say they sell house number one, and now they buy house number two. And in house number two, they put down four hundred thousand dollars right the 350 in equity we had right or the 300 in equity and the hundred thousand so now they put four hundred thousand down let's go on so now at uh, 20 years later the couple is getting a divorce and they need to sell house number two and husband saying well I put a hundred thousand down. I want that straight back. And then, well, we'll split everything else because it was equal community funds. And the wife says, no, we didn't use that hundred thousand of your separate property. We used all community property. So now you got to trace it. So what documents would you need to trace? Well, you're going to need your bank statements prior to marriage that show you have that hundred thousand dollars. Then I'm going to need to see, say you transferred it to a community property bank account in order to make the down payment. So then I need to see bank statement one showing that transfer out to bank account number two showing that transfer in. Once I've shown that, now I'm going to need what other document am I going to need? I'm going to need the bank statement of the community property that shows the money going out into an escrow account or into the down payment of the home. So I'm going to want the buyer's closing statement. I'm going to want the escrow documents for that, right? Showing clearly it went from account one to account two. The next day, we sent it into escrow, and now it's in the buyer's closing statement. So I need all of those documents. So anytime you have a major purchase or a major transfer of property, you need to make sure that the line is clean, that you can show from point A to point B to point C. Your failure to do that, your failure to have a link to each transaction will be fatal to you, right? Now, you, you can always try to get a, a forensic accountant or some other thing, but Again, let's say this happens 25 years from now. How do you protect yourself? The banks aren't going to have the records. The banks aren't going to have the records. No one else is going to have the records. Now, your spouse could be honest and say, this is where it com comes from. But let's also consider that maybe they don't exactly remember or their memory fails them. Under this situation, it is your burden to provide this evidence, provide this documentation. We have to be mindful and, and know, yes, we all want to be happily married. I'm happily married. We never, no one wants to plan to get a divorce, right? Um, you know, so, so a lot of the people, a lot of people won't keep records just in the same way as they won't get a prenup because they feel like it cheapens the marriage or the trust. What I would say is you're worried about protecting yourself because you feel like it is almost bad karma or um, you know, you're speaking negativity out into the universe that somehow um, this relationship isn't going to work. You're not really reasonable or forward thinking with this. You have to protect yourself when you have significant assets. Another thing you could do to protect yourself 
is have a post-nuptial agreement with your spouse. But it just kind of sets the ground rules and it gives people peace of mind on certain things. But the other way that you have the peace of mind, again, is just keeping documents. That's all it is. It's, it's not duplicitous. All I'm asking you to do is protect your rights that are given to you by the law. We need these documents and in order to trace, we need these documents in order to make our case in court. We need these documents in order to allow our heirs down the road to have claims in probate and trust and all these other things. So that also uh, brings me back to keeping proper records when you're entering into a marriage. When, when you get married, what I would do, if you own a business, make sure you're saving the profit and loss statements things that show the general value, the tax returns, anything that shows the value of what you're bringing into the marriage, right? A lot of times we do this as a prenup, but realistically, if you have proper documentation, you don't even need the prenup because a lot of prenups are, everybody, you know, in a lot of prenups, people are just reciting what they have and that it will remain theirs. Well, that's already the law. Your separate property remains your separate property until you do an action to change that, such as commingling or changing the title to a, um, a piece of property. You know, and you guys, this runs, these principles run through into stock accounts, into 401ks, into all of these things, right? If you want your separate property to remain separate property, you have to keep the documentation necessary for it. Because again, say you open up a stock account during marriage and you fund it with $30,000, right? And, or say you buy crypto, right? And you spend $30,000. And over the next 24, 20 years, it rises in value. And say now it's worth millions of dollars. And you could have never possibly guessed that, right? Well, the general presumption, if you can't show where that $30,000 is, was that was community property, right? That was actual community property. And that entire amount now would be community property. So we have to be careful in, in when we enter into a marriage of making sure that it's properly delineated and that you have the documents. So again, document safety. Things happen all the time. I think you need to have a mix of hard copies, um, cloud-based coverage, anything else that you can think of. Just putting it onto a laptop, an old laptop, and hoping you know one day that you know you guys get married and your three-year-old doesn't like spill a soda on your laptop. Don't put things up to chance, right? You can't put things up to chance. You you have to be methodical in what you do. Um, again, this is just the reality of life that. Over 50% of, you know, family law cases end in, or over 50% of marriages end in divorce, right? Um, and it, there's different statistics on, based on different variables and factors um, related to the parties. But the simple fact is, is you need to protect yourself and all you're doing is following the law. All you're doing, you're not trying to take extra money from the other side. All you're trying to do is protect what you had coming in, protect what you already own under the law, right? That's what's important, right? There's nothing nefarious. There's nothing shady about it. It is just protecting what you have. If nothing else gets across to you today, I want this to get across to you, that it is your responsibility to preserve evidence that will show your separate property or right to reimbursement, right? So, one, thou shalt not coming thou shalt not commingle. Two, keep your documents in a safe place. Three, diversify how you keep your documents. Hard copies plus electronic copies. This will keep you with the evidence that you need should things go wrong. And again, this is not a negative thing. This is just preserving your rights in the event that things fall apart, right? I've met so many men, so many men that are like, I don't know what else to do. I didn't have a backup plan. This was it. This is, I put everything into this. There is no backup. And they didn't 
keep their documents. And they didn't keep their documents when they improved the house and spent a bunch of their separate property money. They didn't keep their documents when they purchased a second house or a vacation house using their separate property. They didn't realize that the cash that they had in their house could just disappear when they would have no recourse, right? Protect yourself. Again, it is only protecting your rights, your rights under the law in the state of California and, and federal laws. You've got to be smart. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Any other um, kind of trope that we can put out, you have to protect yourself. Uh, you know, again, if you don't protect yourself in this world, very few other people will. Um, and again, uh, I, I think having these records actually leads in the event that you have a divorce into less litigation. There's less attorney fee costs. There's less um, expert witness costs. It actually makes things easier should things go wrong. So you heard it from me uh, in my discussion on that. Once again, my name is Ryan Dreyer, managing attorney of Real Father's Rights.